We have top three alien abduction stories today. And guys, I just want to make this clear. I'm not just throwing you any story that I find. I really search through a ton of alien abduction stories, and most of them seem like pure BS. Most of them seem very delusional, maybe borderline schizophrenic, definitely didn't happen. Maybe people that are in isolated areas that want attention or fame and they're just kind of finding an avenue to get it. But I found three that really stand out to me that are hard to discredit. Let's go. So the first story today follows this man named Travis Walton. So Travis was raised in Snowflake, Arizona, and he was kind of a rough and tumble guy. I know a lot of guys like these, they're union type guys bricklayers, electricians, garbage men. A lot of the people that I grew up with are very similar to this. They're good dudes, but they're one of the guys. They're just rough dudes. And Travis fit that description. But instead of being a bricklayer or electrician, Travis was actually a logger. So even more rough and tumble. He would go out into major forests and he would just cut down massive fields of trees with him and his guys for weeks at a time. And we're not talking industrial tree clearing. We're talking more of a group of dudes that has chainsaws and pickup trucks and they just drive into this clearing and they clear out a bunch of trees. It was a very ragtag team. They didn't have heavy machinery or anything like that. These were just rough men cutting down trees in the forests of Arizona. And I feel like that's very important to point out to you guys because these aren't guys that would lie about something like this. These are your everyday dudes. The guys that you meet up with every weekend and you just have a couple beers at the pub and you just talk sports regular guys, they wouldn't make up a weird lie together. So Travis got hired to a group of seven workers that were hired to clear this area of trees. And even their boss said that these guys had to be very sharp. Logging is a very dangerous job. It actually has a very high mortality rate for incidents and injuries and things of that nature. So he doesn't hire random guys that have a big imagination and are willing to make up weird lies together. These have to be straight edge, tough dudes that are willing to do work precisely. So on November 5th, 1975, they entered this work site. They had to clear out a 1200 acre plot of land and they're working three full days trying to clear out this area and even working as hard as they can with no breaks they're behind schedule so naturally when you're behind schedule the guys just kind of come together and they're like all right let's do a little bit of overtime and they end up working well into the night to the point where it's almost pitch black and they have to leave at this point just because it's getting too dangerous so they pile back into their pickup truck and they're headed back to the town where they're sleeping and i want to point that out because it's not like this happened in the middle of the day when they were full of energy ready to make up a big lie together in this big story they had worked three hard days in the field and they were completely exhausted. They didn't want something like this to happen. They're driving down one of those small logger roads back to the main road, and these guys are not even talking to each other. They're borderline falling asleep in this car. And as they're driving, just looking out the windows, they all kind of notice this light that's emanating from the forest off to their right. And they didn't say that there was anything particularly odd about it. They just thought, I don't know, maybe it's some spotlights. Maybe there's some other crews working on clearing some trees over here. They didn't really know what it was, and they weren't freaked out initially. It was just a light. It wasn't overly weird but it got everybody's attention and they started chit-chatting about it a little bit and everybody's attention was on this odd light reminder it is the middle of the night in the forest they couldn't really pin down what it was one person suggested it was the moon but the moon was on the other side and then somebody suggested that uh, maybe it's a forest fire maybe we should check it out maybe it's dangerous maybe we should report this let's let's go figure out what this light is so they all decide to just drive over there and check it out so they pull off the little road that they're driving down towards this light into this clearing and then they start to notice that this light is a bit odd it's not what they originally thought and they don't really know what they're looking at and all seven men that were in this car reported a very similar description of what they were looking at and they said that they saw a disc-shaped object that was floating about 150 feet off the ground that was emanating this bizarre light they didn't say it was twirling or flashing or anything of that nature they just said that there was a disc floating in this clearing and travis being the madman that he is he's a really rough and tumble guy like i mentioned he jumps out of the car to get a closer look at this craft he barely even waited for the car to stop he just popped the door open and ran out to get as close as he possibly could to it because they all said that this craft was really beautiful in a way they commented on the beautiful engineering and just the uniqueness of this odd hovering craft and i guess travis just needed to get a closer look they mentioned that the craft was only about 50 to 100 feet away from them and still floating about 100 feet in the air none of the other guys got out of the car it was only travis so they're all watching travis from the car but travis is getting close to this thing and his initial excitement is getting very curious he's 
He can't take his eyes off of this thing that's just defying gravity right in front of him. And Travis, being so curious about this thing, just keeps getting closer and closer and closer to it. And the people in the car start getting a little nervous because the initial excitement of seeing this thing is starting to creep into fear. And they start calling Travis back to the car like, dude, do not get close to that. But Travis wasn't hearing any of it. Like, he could hear them, but he wasn't hearing it. He wanted to get closer to this thing. He wanted to get the best look that he possibly could. He was astonished by what he was looking at. And then as he's looking at it, before it laid motionless, just in the air, not laid, hovered motionless, but as he's looking at it, as he's really close to it, it starts spinning, just spinning a little bit. And then it starts making this hum, just this low monotone sound that all of the guys in the car reported that they heard too. And Travis said it was just a weird sound that was coming off it as it was rotating. The guys in the car really didn't like this and they start yelling at Travis even more to get back to the car. And they start kind of getting through to him because he's like, ah, I don't love this thing moving now. I liked looking at it when it was motionless it wasn't doing anything but now that i'm hearing mechanical sounds from it and it's rotating he starts to get a little bit iffy about the situation but right as he's about to turn around everybody in the car reported this they said a beam of light came out of this craft directly towards travis hit him in the chest and blew him about 20 yards away and everybody in the car reported the exact same thing. They all saw it happen. And obviously you could imagine everybody in the car is kind of freaked out because now this object that was just hovering motionless shot a beam of light at their friend and it shot him 20 yards away. So they kind of freak out and they actually decide to drive away in fear. They went on to say that they thought he died from this. They thought that this thing shot him and he was done. So there was no chance of saving him. They just had to get out of there to save their own lives. And they even reported that a, quite a few of the grown men were crying hysterically and super scared, which isn't something that a regular rough and tumble logger would admit to be super scared and hysterical from seeing an event happen that scared them so bad that they ended up crying in a group of grown men in a car. But after a couple minutes of driving recklessly down these roads, the driver of the vehicle comes to his senses and says, we have to go back for him. It's gonna be a really bad look if he's actually dead and we left him there. What are we gonna tell people? Are we gonna tell him a UFO shot him? Nobody's gonna believe us. They're gonna think we killed him. We have to go back and get him. So they turn the car around and they drive back to where it happened. But unfortunately, there was no craft there. And I'm sure they were pretty happy that there was no craft there because they just saw it shoot their friend with a beam of light. But Travis also wasn't there. And they're just running around this site where this happened and they're freaking out, calling for him, still crying hysterically, just losing it looking for their friend that they just saw get shot with a beam of light. And they don't know what to do at this point. What are they going to say to anybody? Yeah, UFO shot our friend. What are they supposed to do? Obviously, they're freaking out. Eventually, they had to give up the search because what are they going to stay out here all night? Eventually, the police are going to have to get involved. So we got to go to them right now, right after it happened, because we need to give them an explanation. Otherwise, we're going to be in serious trouble. It's going to look like we probably killed him. We probably hit his body and we didn't report it for hours. We got to go to them right now. So they get back into their car and they just drive down the same road that they were driving down. They get to the main road and they find a payphone. So one of the crew members goes into this payphone and calls the sheriff department and he's like, hey, we can't find our friend. He doesn't give them any further details because he feels like we need to give them the details once they're here. They need to get out here right now and they need to come to this site where this happened and they need to see that we are being honest about this and we're genuinely worried about our friend. Other people would say that are skeptical of the situation, you need to see, <laughs> you need to hear the sound of my voice for the manipulation to work, but I believe them. So they call the sheriffs and they head over. So two police officers arrive to the scene and they basically ask, what are we dealing with? What's going on here, guys? And they go on to describe what they saw. They were beating around the bush initially, but finally one of the crew members was just like, hey, sheriff, we saw a UFO. It shot a beam of light at our friend. We don't know what else to tell you. This is what we saw. And of course, naturally, the sheriffs are like, come on, dude, what are we talking about here? Where's your friend? What actually happened here? They're skeptical immediately. The police officers immediately say, guys, we're going to have to search the vehicle. Let me see if you guys have anything in here. And the whole crew is like, dude, get in there. We didn't do anything. We're completely innocent. Check our truck. Do whatever you want us to do. You will find that we're innocent. Then you're going to actually start believing us. So they let them search the truck and they didn't find anything. The police officers went on to do a field sobriety test, making sure that these guys aren't under the influence of anything, alcohol, drugs, anything of that nature. And they even said after the whole incident, they felt like these guys definitely went through something. He could tell that these guys were genuinely shaken up. They saw something weird. There was a weird vibe there. But even seeing how distraught these guys were in his heart, he felt like they did something to Travis. He felt like they harmed Travis and they had to come up with this fantastical story to make it seem like a UFO hurt their friend. So he isn't really buying it at this point. The morning comes around and these police officers have to set up a massive search looking for this guy. 
you have to. The crew members said he got shot by a UFO, but we're not buying that. So we actually have to go find Travis right now. We have to hear what Travis has to say about this, or we have to find Travis's body so we can convict these guys. So they start implementing this massive search around the area that they said it happened. But throughout this massive search with dogs and volunteers and hundreds of people, they find no signs of Travis. There's no evidence. They can't find him anywhere. And the cops that were skeptical start doing a little low key interrogation to the crew members while they're out there just coming over and whispering to him, hey, if you guys tell us where he is, reduce sentence. Like, just tell us. We'll, we'll go easier on you if you just tell us. And the crew members start freaking out because they're like, we have no alibi. He was just with us. He was on this site with us all day, and we just told the police that a UFO shot him. They don't believe it, and he's gone. So they're freaking out. They don't know what to do. They don't know what else to tell this guy other than what they saw happen. So they start getting involved in the search because they're like, we have to find some evidence to clear our names, or we have to find Travis. Best case scenario, we find our friend, and he tells the police the exact same story that we told him, and then we're all in the clear. But they noticed during the search, there was a couple dudes during the search that were wearing like red Hazvac jackets. I think that's what those are called. And they have these weird like metal detectors that are like scanning the ground, trying to detect something. So one of the crew members approaches one of these men that's in red because he's assuming that this guy is some type of uh, psychic that's looking for some type of paranormal activity in the area. And he's like, this is perfect. We definitely saw something that was out of the ordinary. And he goes up to this dude and he's like, hey, what are you guys searching for? What, do, what are you guys trying to detect with those machines? And the guy in red replies, oh, we're searching for radiation. We're trying to detect radiation in the area. And he went on to ask them, who were they represented by? What, what organization were they with? And they were just like, I have no answers for you, buddy. I'm just looking for radiation. But this crew member's light bulb in his head starts going off. He sees this as an opportunity to clear his name because something weird happened here. There was a big ball of light. There was a beam. And he's like, maybe they're actually going to be able to detect radiation. Maybe this is going to be an opportunity to convince the police that we're telling them the truth. And he asked this guy to scan him and his crew to see if they're radioactive because they were close enough to this thing that maybe they got a little bit of radiation from whatever this craft was. But when they scanned them, there was zero evidence of radioactivity on them and they're a little bit disappointed, but they're like, ah, that was worth a shot. But then the crew member realizes they had all went home and changed from the incident. So he thought if there was radioactive material on us or, or some type of radiation emanating from us, maybe it's on our clothes that are at home. But then he remembered we have our hard hats that we were wearing during the incident in the truck. So he brings over his hard hat and he goes, here give this a try scan this and the man in red just goes okay and he scans the hard hat and the meter that's on this machine immediately goes from zero to 100. this thing is completely radioactive and the crew member's expecting to have this redemption thing he wants a little bit of answers from this he saw some surprise on this guy's face when it went to 100 and he he's hoping to get alleviated of all of these accusations that these police officers are putting on him but the guy in red just calls over to his other friends in red and just shows them the meter and then they just walk off without giving him any answers so the crew member doesn't really like that they're just leaving not giving them any answers so he immediately goes over to the police officers who don't like him the police officers 100 percent think that him and his crew killed Travis. It's, so it's a tense situation, but he goes, yo, who are those guys in red that were looking for radiation? And the police officer goes, who are you talking about? I don't have anybody here looking for radiation. The, everybody that's here is here under my orders looking for the guy that you killed. I don't know what you're talking about, radiation or guys in red. I'm still suspicious of you. Can you get away from me so I could find this dead body that you guys committed? And even after the entire situation, nobody ever figured out who those men in red were. The police officers didn't know. The search party didn't know, and they didn't see them after that. So there was just these mysterious guys in red searching for radiation that decided to walk off after they got a 100% radiation meter result. And then nobody knew who they were, and then they disappeared, and there was no answers. But what are they supposed to do? They just have to continue searching. They just have to let the situation play out. So they're searching for days and days and days, and nobody finds Travis. There's no evidence being found. And it gets to the point where they're probably going to have to call off the search. And at this point, as the search is dying down, the entire area, the whole town, 100% thinks it's this crew. They totally killed him. And everybody who's in their right mind would agree with them. They're working out there. They're, they're doing long days. They have chainsaws. They're doing logging. Something happened. Are they hiding an incident? Did they have an argument with them? Are all these guys in on it? The whole community thinks that they did it. They are enemy number one. Not to mention that they said a UFO did it. So now everybody's just like, these quacks. These guys think that they're going to get away with murder by saying a UFO did it. So everything is looking bad on this crew. But the UFO thing was common knowledge. The police tried to immediately discredit it in the media and in the newspapers. But the newspapers seemed to like the story of a UFO abduction more than they liked a missing persons report. Because most news companies like to elevate fantastical stories for ratings and views and buys. 
So they were kind of running with the kidnapped into a spacecraft story. And the police department is so fed up with this because all of these news organizations are reaching out to them, calling their department, talking about UFOs and sightings and all these fantastical things. But in their heads, they're like, this crew killed this guy. Can you guys please stop calling us about the UFO? We have a missing persons case. And they're growing real resentment for this crew. So since the police department was so fed up, they're like, you know what? Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get the crew in here and let's do a full lie detector test about the entire situation. And let's show the media and show the public that these dudes are lying about this UFO. And they get one of the nation's best polygraph testers and they fly him in and they have all of the six crewmen examined. And the results of the tests are very surprising. Five out of six of the crew members passed the test with flying colors. As far as a polygraph test goes, these guys were absolutely telling the truth. And the sixth guy wasn't charged with lies. It was just inconclusive. It was like, we can't really tell if he's lying or not. It was just an inconclusive bad test. But five out of the six passed with flying colors. And this polygraph tester even went on record to say, if these guys are lying, it's kind of crazy because to get past my test, five out of six of them to get past my test is so unlikely, but they did. And the examiner genuinely believed that they were telling the truth. And the examiner goes and tells the police officer his findings. And the police officer is like, are you kidding me? The police officer thought this was gonna stop this entire hoax and they were gonna be able to just go on with the search and go actually look for Travis's body. And it was gonna be a pure criminal investigation. But now he's standing there like, even the polygraph guy is pushing this narrative. What, like, what do we do now? But this is where it gets really, really bizarre. Five days after Travis went missing, after this UFO shot him with a beam of light and they search for him in this area for five days straight, Travis shows back up. Travis comes back alive. And Travis goes on to say that when he woke up, he was just laying face down in the middle of a road with no recollection of what time it was or what day it was. And he looked up and he saw the bottom end of the ship that he had seen the other day, which he didn't know was the other day, he just recalls looking back up and seeing a very similar object and it just shoots off into the sky. And he's just laying there face down, borderline incoherent on the middle of a road in the same area that this thing shot him with a beam of light. So he just wakes up in the middle of nowhere, stands up, saw this craft fly off, but he's in the middle of nowhere in complete darkness. And he's like, I need to go find somebody. I need to go tell somebody what happened to me. And he's just freaking out and he gets up and he just makes his way down the road, closer to civilization to a rest stop. And he just finds a payphone. He immediately calls his brother on this payphone and his brother initially doesn't even believe that he's talking to Travis on the other end of this phone because five days have passed. Nobody found him during this search. Everybody was kind of losing hope at this point, but Travis was able to convince him that it was him. And he's like, hey, you gotta come pick me up. Travis went on to say that he wasn't even aware that days had passed. He thought it might've been minutes. He didn't really know what happened. He thought it could have just been 10 minutes ago that I saw that craft in that clearing and that happened to me, but he wasn't really aware of what was going on. He just knew that he needed to get picked up. He needed his brother there. And Travis's brother is looking at him like, bro, what are you talking about? Where have you been? Like, were you hiding in the forest? Like, why would you freak us all out like that? What are you talking about? You've been gone for five days. And once Travis is told that he's been gone for five days, he just starts internally panicking. He doesn't remember what happened. He's freaking out. He's like, something happened, felt like a couple minutes ago, what do you mean I've been gone for five days? And he just goes silent, goes into a catatonic state. He doesn't know how to communicate with anybody. He's trying to rationalize it to himself. Travis's brother sees how bad of shape he's in. And obviously he wants to tell the police like, hey, I found him. But number one priority is to get my brother to a hospital and make sure that he's okay and hydrated. He looks in a really bad state. So I just want to take him straight to the hospital. So his brother drives him all the way to Phoenix, Arizona and asks the doctors like, hey, I'm going to eventually tell the police in the news. I just want this to be a little discreet. He's in bad shape. Can you just make sure he's okay do it do a couple examinations on him for this whole media frenzy starts and the doctors comply because they kind of understand they see the concern in the brother's eyes and they just start running tests on him and obviously he was very dehydrated and starved down quite a bit but he didn't have any noticeable physical damage on his body so they weren't overly concerned they said the only mark that they found on him was one puncture wound on his arm but travis wasn't a drug user or anything of that nature so they're just like i don't know maybe a stab with a stick maybe a fall something of that nature there was only one puncture wound on him there was no major gashes or impacts or any severe bruising it was just this one puncture wound and then dehydration and starvation one of the tests that they ran was a drug test obviously because the crew that he was with said that he was abducted by aliens. So let's see if all these guys were on shrooms or something of that nature, but he was completely clean, zero drugs or alcohol in his system. So after he cleared all of these examinations and they said he's in pretty good health, 
the brother took him back home to his hometown of Snowflake, Arizona. But by the time they got to their hometown, word had spread. I guess some nurses or some doctors started whispering. Somebody called somebody. So by the time they got to their hometown, the police were calling them. All these people were calling the brother like, hey, we know you found him. What's up? And the police officer that was on scene that was searching for Travis for days got wind of it. And he pulls up straight to where Travis is goes to his brother, he's like, I gotta talk to this guy. And the police officer even said that when he saw Travis, he looked like he was catatonic. He looked in bad shape. He looked like he was in fear and complete shock. He was not in good shape. And to this police officer's surprise, when he starts asking Travis what happened, expecting him to say, my crew members turned on me. They tried to kill me. I had to get away. I've been hiding in the woods for weeks. Travis says, me and my crew pulled up and we saw a UFO, immediately matching the story of the crew members. And the police officer is like, are you kidding me? Now this guy that we just found that we've, that we've been searching for for days is matching the crew member's stories of this UFO. And Travis goes on to say, I got struck by some beam of light also matching the crew's story. And then he says, I just woke up in the middle of the road and I saw this thing fly away. The police officer has no idea what to do because he was expecting some type of new information to go arrest the crew members. What is he gonna do? Arrest Travis Walton for being missing? He's clearly in a bad state. He clearly wasn't hiding and eating well and hydrating well. He was clearly missing. He was clearly scared. He was clearly catatonic. So what is he going to do? Arrest Travis? Or is he going to go arrest the crew that he thought had murdered Travis or had hurt him? But now Travis's story matches the crew. Like, what does this police officer do at this point? And now the news just starts flooding in. All of these media organizations are trying to get some information about what's going on. And with all of these news organizations reaching out, one in particular got a hold of them. It was the National Enquirer, and they offered to pay for a bunch of Travis's examinations and move him to a remote area to get him away from all the other news medias. And they thought, that seems like a pretty good opportunity. Like, we don't really have any other options here. Everybody's just asking us for answers. It's a whole chaotic situation. Travis is in bad shape. We don't want him answering all these questions from the news. This was a traumatic experience. So they're like, maybe we go with the National Enquirer. So by the time he's sitting in front of the National Enquirer answering their questions, he had time to let everything settle in. And apparently some memories had started leaking back into his mind. It wasn't just blank space anymore. He didn't just get flashed with light and wake up in a road. He started to remember what happened in that five day stretch. And now I'm going to give you a play by play of exactly what Travis Walton said happened to him that night and those nights that he was missing. He said, just like the crew members said, he had gotten out of the car and he approached the craft. He recalls his crew members yelling for him, telling him to come back to the car, and he remembers getting smashed with a beam of light. He said he lost consciousness for a little bit after getting smashed with this beam of light, but he woke up on some type of medical table with people around him that were wearing like doctor's masks, and he saw a light above him that looked like a soft studio light, and he was just laying there. He was kind of half coherent, half awake, half not awake, and he initially thought he must be in a hospital of some sort. He thought, whatever hit me definitely did some damage. I lost consciousness, and now I'm in a hospital, and people are taking care of me, but like I said, he's half awake. He's barely seen around him. He doesn't really know what's going on. But he said as he started to gain consciousness and his vision started getting a little bit clearer, he was able to look down at his chest and he mentioned that there was an odd rectangular box just sitting on his chest. And he said it didn't really make much sense to him because it wasn't regular medical equipment. It was just a weird box sitting on his chest, but he still felt like he was in some type of emergency room. And while Travis is confused looking at this box, he then turns his attention towards one of the medical professionals, hoping to see maybe a pretty face of a nurse or something that is going to relieve the stress, somebody that's gonna tell him he's okay and he survived and they're gonna take care of him and he's gonna be fine. But when he hones in on but when he hones in on the person that's working on him, he notices something that terrifies him. And he says that he was looking at something that resembled a modern day gray alien, a small little being that had light gray skin, very small appendages, a big head with large eyes. And he goes on to say he was immediately terrified. He was so scared and he was scared for his life because he felt an immense sense of pain at that point. He felt like he was mortally wounded and he felt like they are doing it to me. And that's not a person. So whatever they're doing is causing me this pain. And he immediately associated this feeling of being mortally wounded with the people that are around him. And then the people that are around him aren't people. So he starts freaking out. And he goes on to say that he immediately swung his arm at the one that was tending to him. And this is a very odd detail that I found fascinating, but also terrifying. He said that he felt very weak, like he wouldn't be able to fight off a human. But when he pushed this thing, it moved like it was weightless. 
it just fell over. It just fell into the other ones that were in the room. He said it felt like pushing a little kid that just had no muscle or weight behind him. And he got some distance from these things and he immediately got up and he said he grabbed an item that was in the room to try to ward off these aliens that he's seeing. And he explained that he picked up something that resembled a glass cylinder. That just It was just like a little rod that he could use to baton them. And he's standing in this corner of the room, screaming at them, freaking out, terrified with this weapon, acting like an absolute madman. He said once he was in the corner of this room, screaming at these things, he noticed that there was three of them. There wasn't just one, there was three gray alien things in this room with him. And they're just kind of standing there. And he recalls, he said it almost looked like they were a little bit scared of him. They weren't trying to approach him, but they were just kind of standing there emotionless, not really knowing what to do with the situation while he's just in the corner of the room freaking out and flailing. And he was expecting at any moment for them to come and attack him, but they just turn around, they walk out of the room. So once these little creatures leave the room and he's just standing there freaking out, trying to find a way out of whatever room that he's in, he described the room as oddly futuristic. He, he said that there was no sharp edges. Everything just kind of looked like it was melted together, but he's just touching all of the walls, trying to find a way out. And eventually somebody else walks into the room and he's expecting to immediately go into fight or flight mode and fight off one of these gray aliens. But it's a person that's wearing a spacesuit, and it just looked like a person. It looked like your regular typical human. And he even went on to say that if they walked through a crowd, you wouldn't suspect anything. They looked like a person. And this initially got him a little bit more comfortable. And he starts asking this guy questions like, you're something familiar. What's going on here? Like, I'm freaking out here. Can you please give me some answers? But this person just starts escorting him to a different room. So he's just following this guy's lead. He's asking this guy a bunch of questions. He's like, you're a fellow human. What's going on here? Please make this make sense to me. But this guy is completely ignoring him. He's not answering even one question. He's barely even noticing that Travis is talking to him. But Travis feels comfortable enough with him to just keep following him. And he said that this guy brought him into this weird large hangar. And this guy just brings him through this hangar into another room that was just a bright white odd room. And there was three more humans in there wearing spacesuits. Even though this guy's not answering any questions, he's like, all right, well, at least they're human. Now I'm in this other room. At least I'm away from those gray aliens. Do you guys want to tell me what's going on here? But he starts to get a little worrisome of them because the guy just leads him over to another table, very similar to the table that he was just on. And now all four of them force him onto this table and just put a mask over his face that must have been putting some type of gas into his mouth and he completely blacks out and then he wakes up on the road looking up at the craft that zooms away into the sky and that was the end of his experience. So now we're right back to where we were, where Travis woke up and walked to the payphone and called his brother and is now just getting hit with this media storm where he's telling this story of a UFO abduction after he was missing for five days and he was in the news for five days and he actually isn't able to even contact any of the other crew members for weeks. But finally, when he gets to meet up with the crew, after this whole media storm starts to die down, they're like, dude, what happened? Please tell us what happened. And he explains everything that I just explained to you. And everybody in the crew believes him. They all believe him. They all saw the same thing. Nobody else in the world believes him, but the people that were in the crew believe him. These really rough and tumble union workers are like, yeah, dude, we saw you get shot from a UFO with a beam of light and you were missing for five days. What you're telling us isn't super unrealistic. And to this day, all seven men stand by their story. They say that they believe Travis. They stand by what happened that night. 40 years later, they're saying the exact same thing. This is what I saw. I don't care what you say about me. I know you think it's a hoax. I know you think I'm lying. This is what I saw that night. We passed the polygraph test. Travis came back and said the exact same thing. Why would all seven of us destroy our credibility and borderline ruin our lives to make up this fantastical story? And that's why this story stood out to me. Travis has done a series of interviews since then going over the entire experience. And you could tell that he's a pretty troubled guy at this point. And you could also tell that he's kind of started buying into even more theories about the UFO phenomenon. I watched him on Joe Rogan where he broke down the whole situation and he just kept pivoting his story into rational realizations about what happened to him. You could tell that he's a man that's trying to figure out what he went through. It doesn't seem like a guy that's, hey, this is this amazing story that happened to me. It seems like a man that's really troubled and hurt and traumatized about something that happened to him that he can't describe, that he never saw anything like it again. And he's just trying to make it make sense to himself. And he goes off on tangents about how he was initially fearful of these creatures and how he, he was kind of ashamed of that and how he didn't feel like they actually meant him any harm. But to me, it seemed like it was an older gentleman that was traumatized in his younger years 
that was trying to cope with a horrible situation. And you could also tell that he's been kind of adopted into the UFOlogy community, and he has a lot of people talking into his ear about their philosophies and, and their hypotheses about what happened to him. And he honestly just kind of sounds a little bit confused. But the one thing that he's not confused about is the series of events that happened to him, and he stands by them. And you could tell that he's ashamed to tell the story, and you could tell that he's a little embarrassed to be Travis Walton. You could tell he's embarrassed to be the UFO guy. You could tell it really messed up his life, and now he's just put into this box, and he's just put into this box of being this like hysterical, fantastical hoax maker, this UFO abductee quack, and you could tell it bugs him but he doesn't know how to be anybody else. It really seems like he believes that this thing happened to him and it's actually kind of devastating. So this second incident follows a very unique series of events in Berkshire, Massachusetts. I chose this one for a very similar reason as I did the other one. There was an overwhelming amount of witnesses and I feel like that's what makes it compelling. If multiple people are all witnessing the same thing, it's very hard to discredit a group. And the story before this, it was a group of seven dudes that were all together and they witnessed something together. But this one is a group of multiple strangers experiencing very similar things on the same night in the same region in Massachusetts. So over 15 years ago in Berkshire, Massachusetts, multiple witnesses all claimed to have very specific experiences with a UFO on the same night of September 1st. There's numerous accounts from all of these people claiming to have seen very similar things and even some of them claiming to have been abducted on that night. This was on September 1st, 1969. I don't think I said the year. And when I start to tell you the story of the abductions that happened, I'm expecting you to be a bit skeptical and so am I. But I think they're worth listening to because of the overwhelming amount of witnesses that experienced the same thing on the same night. So the story that we're gonna follow first follows this individual named Thomas Reed. So I wanna give you a little bit of a backstory on Thomas before we go into the actual incident. When Tom was young, his family relocated from New York City to Berkshire, Massachusetts and he didn't particularly like living on a farm. He would get very lonely out there, being very used to the fast-paced life of New York City, so his only person that he was very close to in that region was his brother. So well before the famous Berkshire incident, Thomas Reed actually had multiple incidents happen to him on his family's farm that him and his brother both say that they experienced. In 1966, three years prior to the most famous incident, him and his brother both recalled seeing figures in their hallway in the middle of the night, and they remember seeing mysterious lights around their house coming in through their window. And then like magic, it was almost as if they were teleported into the nearby woods with his brother. And they both claimed to be looking at this UFO that was hovering right off of the ground that looked like some type of turtle shell. And they don't remember how they got from their house to this field looking at this UFO. And then he went on to say that as he's looking at this odd turtle shell shaped craft, they experienced another flash of light, a weird flash of light. And he had another lapse of memory, another blackout. He didn't know what happened. And just like that, him and his little brother are now inside of this UFO. I don't know how they would know that they were inside of it because they just saw it and then a blip of light and then they were in something. So they just assumed that they were inside of this UFO, but that's what they assumed. And both of the boys say that the only thing that they remember from that incident was seeing some type of picture on the wall that depicted some type of willow tree. And then just like that, like magic, they were back in their house. And then just one year later, they had a very similar experience. Again, at night, they randomly started seeing these obscure lights, and then they started hearing these odd sounds of doors opening and closing. And just like that, almost like magic, they're back in this craft. But this time, their parents noticed that they weren't in the house particularly the mom, Nancy, couldn't find her sons. She searched the entire property and she couldn't find her sons anywhere. The boys went on to say that the only memory that they had was on the ship and then it was like they were again teleported and he was just face down on the driveway of his house. And his mother that was out on her farm searching for him decided to come back and found him on this spot in their driveway. So these two kids already had these very weird, vivid experiences about seeing lights and getting put onto a craft and just having these lapses of time and just these blackouts. And then a couple years later, one of the most famous UFO incidents occurred in their town that had multiple witnesses. Over a dozen people in their county witnessed the exact same thing and reported and reported very similar things that was happening to them for the past couple years. To me, that gives it a little bit more credibility. I'm telling you this for fun. I'm still very skeptical about it, but just enjoy it. So on Labor Day, September 1st, 1969, this is the Berkshire incident. So the Reed family was having dinner at a diner and they decided to leave and head home. And in the car was just the mother, the grandmother, and the two boys. So it was around 8.30 p.m. and they all got in the car and they started heading home. So on their way home, there's a main route and then there's a more scenic route. 
and Miss Reed, the mother of the two sons, decided to take the more scenic route. She liked to go on this odd trail that went over this little bridge that just brought them through a nice scenic area and then eventually got them home. So they turned off the main road, they went down the scenic road, and they're approaching this bridge. So as they're pulling up to this scenic bridge that's completely made of wood, the grandmother reported to see this odd bleed of light that was coming up through the wooden boards of the bridge. And then they also start started seeing odd lights in the trees surrounding them. They were a little bit confused because obviously they had their headlights on and their headlights were shining into this dark bridge, but it didn't seem like the light that they were seeing was emanating from their own headlights, so they started to get a little bit confused. They still proceed to drive over the bridge and right when they get to the other side, Thomas Reed, the main person in this story, reported that he was handing his little brother a little fireball candy and his grandmother turned around to kind of scold him like to remind him he's too young for a candy but at that moment she noticed this odd white orb out of the window as she was turning around to go scold her grandsons and she was the first one to notice it. They described it as like an odd floating slightly illuminated cue ball just floating in the air right over this river. He estimated that it was about four times the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. So this thing was rather big and it was just a floating glowing ball. But as they kept driving, it was almost as if this ball was kind of mirroring them and it was just following their car as they were starting to drive away from it. At this point, everybody in the car is kind of fixated on this odd ball of light that's following their car and it's just hiding behind some of the trees, but they could still see it. They're driving the car very slowly because obviously they're kind of eyeing this thing. And this thing is just mirroring them perfectly and they get about 20 to 30 feet further and his little brother notices another ball of light out of the other window. So now there's two odd spherical glowing balls mirroring their car on either sides. But this ball of light wasn't white. This one was like a glowing orange. He, he describes it as if it looked like a little floating sun. He said it wasn't just glowing. This one had like a texture, like a little swirl to it. You could see something on the surface of it was moving and swooshing. So they have these two odd balls of light mirroring them as they're driving. So they decide to start to pull over. And they're still swinging their heads trying to track these two odd balls of light. But then they notice almost directly in front of them, out into a clearing, like just kind of like a field. He said it looked like a big floating turtle shell shaped craft and he said that this one was incredibly larger than the two spheres that they saw before he estimated that this craft was almost as large as a football field and he said that this one was floating well over the trees and it was just standing there stationary massive and he was explaining that this craft also had unique colors it it was giving off these odd ambers and had this texture to it. And the surface of it was also moving very similar to the other two, but unique in its own way. He mentioned that no sound was coming off of this craft. It was just absolutely silent, which added to how bizarre it was because it was absolutely massive and it was floating. How could this thing not give off any sound? And as they're looking at this thing inside of their car, all of a sudden gets absolutely immersed with this weird light. He explains that it wasn't like somebody put a spotlight into their eyes. It was almost as if everything in the car just illuminated. Like it wasn't nighttime anymore, as if it would just turned into daytime inside of their vehicle. He said that that odd light stayed on for a moment and then it just turned off. And then all of the crickets and animals in the entire area started to erupt. And it was like the forest turned on. And then boom, just like his story from a couple years earlier, that's the last thing that he remembered from the car. He had another blackout, but this time his grandmother and his mother were with him. And the next thing he remembers is being in some type of hangar. He said as a kid, it reminded him of what he imagined an airplane hangar would be like. He said that he woke up on some type of cart and he almost like slipped and fell off when he regained consciousness. And he was just looking around at the space and he was mentioning tubes that he was seeing on the wall. He had little faint details, but he was kind of half conscious, half not. But the thing that woke him up completely was somebody or something grabbing him on the arm. And he said he was guided about 10 to 15 yards through another doorway. He said he was brought into this odd room that had like weird metallic walls and he was placed onto another table. And he said as he was laying there, he was looking at, up at some type of light fixture or apparatus and he just got a weird feeling from being on this table. And then he could faintly hear his mother calling him. And he couldn't tell if it was from another room. He could just definitely hear his mother calling him. And he said as he was laying there hearing the screams of his mother some type of body cage was put over on top of him it wasn't pressing him down or holding him in there it was as if just this body cage was meant to be over him for some type of scan then he said somebody put these odd raisin looking things onto him he said that they just looked like big raisins and they were just placed onto different parts of his body and then he goes on to remember just being in pain and screaming and the whole situation was just terrifying and they must have put some type of veil over his face but he could see figures a little bit through the veil while he's hearing his brother and his mother screaming for him he described at one point he felt like he was laying on boiling water for minutes at a time and then just like that 
poof, he's back in the car. And then when he's back in the car with his brother, his mother, and his grandmother, they're all coming too at the same time. But the grandmother woke up first, and she said right when she woke up, everybody was just laying in the car with her, but the car was off. And that's super bizarre because it's just an entire family driving home from a diner, and the grandmother wakes up and they're in pitch black in this area that was just like this remote area with a bridge and a little bit of a scenic route, and they would have just been taking a nap in sequence together in the middle of the dark forest. It's just a bizarre situation. And then once they all started coming to, they were all very freaked out, and, and the first thing that they did was just drive to get help. The weirdest part about this situation is that the mother, the grandmother, and his brother all had very similar experiences. They all remembered being brought onto something, and they all remember hearing each other screaming, and they all remember going through some type of pain. And once they got help, Thomas Reed had a puncture wound in the middle of his chest, and his brother had one behind his ear. So they actually had physical things happening to them, but it just looked like a regular puncture wound, like somebody put an IV somewhere. It wasn't anything major, so they don't really have anything to go on. And I know this sounds like a fantastical story, but what makes this one so weird is that on that night, there were over a dozen witnesses calling into the police department saying that they were seeing UFOs and weird lights in the sky. And there was even other people in the area that also claimed to be abducted that night. So either this was one mass hallucination, maybe it was just a big flow of gas coming in from a nuclear plant that just made everybody have a mass hallucination, or these people went through something absolutely bizarre and honestly terrifying to just come across three weird objects and one massive one and then being blipped onto the ship, not to mention remembering being blipped onto a ship two times in the past three years. So this was a reoccurring incident for this man. And I'm not trying to sell you this story or try to ask you to believe it. I just always think it's very fascinating when multiple people who don't know each other all experience very similar things. And then multiple people come together and say, this thing happened to us. Like it was his mom, his grandma, and his brother. If it was just two kids making it up, why would the mother and the grandmother be willing to go on with this weird story? Just let it be in the kid's imagination. If he just wants attention and wants to sound special like he got abducted, just let him. But why would the mother and the grandmother back up his story and go and find help terrified? So instances like that freak me out. They get my attention, they get my interest because there's police reports of it and there's, and there's multiple eyewitness accounts. He doesn't mention them ever returning or doing it to them again. So who really knows? If they were visiting him multiple times and doing this to him multiple times, why would it just stop randomly? I have my doubts, but tell me what you think. So this last story actually follows the same incident, that same Berkshire incident. But like I said, multiple people in that area said something happened that same exact night, September 1st, 1969. So this story follows this woman named Melanie Kirchdorfer. So Melanie explains, just like Thomas Reed, that this was Labor Day weekend. So her and her family were out enjoying the holiday and they were near a lake in the area. So she explained that they just lived a couple streets over from the lake. She was with her parents and her parents wanted to go get ice cream to celebrate the holiday and have some fun with the kids. So they got some ice cream and they came by this lake. And they're just sitting in their car, enjoying the festivities, enjoying the ice cream, looking out on this beautiful lake. And they see an odd light start emerging from the sky, right over the trees, coming over the lake. And they all see it at the same time. They said it was a little bit cloudy, and the first thing that they saw was just the glow of something. And her father started to get a little freaked out, and he was like, what is that? And then they said that it emerged from the clouds, and it was this massive craft. And the way they explained it, it sounds very, very similar to what Thomas Reed explained. This massive craft, almost as big as a football field, with odd coloring that emits a weird light that's the shape of a turtle shell. And very, very foolishly, the father says that he has to follow this thing because it's not stopping right there. And they're in their car, so he just has to turn it on and he has to follow this thing. This massive, weird craft, I could kind of see how it could overtake somebody's emotion that they're like, I just need to get a good look at this. I've never seen anything like this. We might never see anything like this again. So I got to follow it. But his kids were in the car, so I kind of disagree with them. I would say drive the other way. But the dad decides to go down the road chasing this thing just to keep looking. And this poor woman says that all she remembers is freaking out, asking her dad to stop chasing this thing. And then just like that, she said that she was levitating over the street. I know that sounds ridiculous. And the way she talks about it is a little fantastical how she says, she says things like, when that happens, you can't move. You could only use your eyes as if it's kind of like a common knowledge thing. But when she explains it, she is explaining it with fear in her eyes, like, like she experienced this. She then explains that the only thing she remembers after being levitated 
is being on a table in a metallic room. Very similar to what Thomas Reed said. I know this is very similar to what everybody says, but it's odd that it happened on the same night and these people didn't know each other, so I'm gonna keep going. She doesn't say that she experienced any type of pain. She didn't see anybody in particular. She just knows that she was there and she just remembers being there. She then says that she remembers getting moved to a different room and that this room was filled with other children. And she just remembers sitting there looking around at these other children and that they would just disappear one by one by one. And then after all of the other kids disappeared, all she remembers is waking up on the beach of the lake that they were at previously. And she woke up on this beach and her entire family was gone. Her mother and her sister can't remember how they got home and she was actually gone for a full day. She went on to say that her parents started to encourage her to not talk about the incident to anybody because people would think that she's crazy. She even goes on to say that her parents like locked her in basements to stop her from talking to any reporters or police. They just didn't want anybody to know because they didn't want anybody to think that their family was crazy. And that's pretty sad and pretty traumatizing just by itself, like locking your kid in a basement who just experienced something that they thought was very traumatic. Even if they made it up, they thought it was traumatic. I don't know, moving on. She then goes on to explain that she has like an issue with electricity and electronics. Like if she walks past lights, sometimes they blow up. Or if she walks past computers, they start to malfunction and turn off. I don't know if I believe this. I would have to see it. Maybe she walks around with magnets in her pockets. But if they were doing these odd experiments on them, and then she was actually having reactions to electronics, that's kind of bizarre. I would like to see her get tested. But she claims that this happens very frequently. But she doesn't just say that she has these magic powers of blowing up computers and blowing up light bulbs. She actually says that she has a ton of ailments that started then. She she says that she has horrible stomach issues, she has a constant ringing in her ears, she has major nasal issues. She is convinced that they did irreparable damage to her that night. She even says that her eyes have never been the same, like she doesn't even have good vision at this point. Like they did something that was so deteriorating to her body that she never recovered from it. And I just want to finish this up by saying there isn't much evidence that this happened to this woman. And there isn't much evidence that that happened to Thomas Reed. I feel like the first story that I told about Travis Walton does have a pretty good amount of evidence, but the last two, especially this one, it's very up to interpretation and they're very good stories, but I chose to tell them to you because of how many people witnessed it all on the same night. And I feel like things like that aren't a coincidence. If you guys would like more alien related stories or abductions or the story of Bob Lazar or anything deeper into this subject, I find it very interesting and fascinating and I would be happy to give you more stories on this subject. So just let me know in the comments if you would like more of these. I hope you enjoyed these stories. I hope they I hope they freaked you out a little bit and made you think about some interesting things that you haven't thought about before. Let me know in the comments if you believe them. I'm still not sure if I do, but it was very fun to make this video for you. And if you guys haven't subscribed to the channel yet and hit the notification bells, please do so. I deliver multiple videos a week, scary, strange, spooky, fun, serial killers, story boy originals. You guys will love the content. I'm pumping out as much as I can. Your support means the world to me. If you've never liked a video before in your entire life, let this be the first one. And if you guys really want more videos, if you want me to get up, get to uploading three to four videos a week, hit that join button below and join our exclusive membership. If we keep growing that, I'll be able to get so many videos out so consistently. I love you guys. I'll see you in like two days.